Hello everyone, welcome to the introduction to mechanical engineering and industrial engineering course MEC 130. This is revision for the force analysis and stress analysis. These two topics that have been covered over the previous videos, which are two important subjects or topics of mechanical design. We mentioned that force analysis is just to find the unknown forces, calculate the resultant force. Stress analysis is just to find the stresses or calculate the stresses that would be produced because of a force that acting on the mechanical element or mechanical component. So the objective of, through this video is just to give you more practice, more examples of more examples on different applications related to these topics, force analysis and stress analysis. So let us start with this first exercise here, which is exercise number one, that this is the following is a ring that is subjected to a set of three forces represented as given. This is a ring. This ring has so many parts. So this is the ring that is already fixed to a platform down here through bolt and nut, but forget about these details of fixing and supporting this uh, ring, but the key condition here, or the key thing that you should understand, because of these forces, this ring will not be able to move. This ring is fixed to the ground. It is stationary. It means that this force will produce some deformation, strain, and stresses within this ring. And this is the objective of this exercise. For example, like exa uh, like requirement C, just to calculate the normal stresses and normal strains, uh, normal strain acting over this bar. So this ring, it has like, like two essential parts. The ring itself, and it is extended with this portion, this is as a bar. So this is the bar of this ring itself that is used for supporting these three forces, F1, F2, F3, with 800 bound force, 350 bound force, and 150 bound force. Make sense? If the bar of the ring, so the bar of the ring, he is talking about this part, starting from this line going down, this rectangular piece, this is the bar which has a circular cross section. So this bar of this ring, it has this circular, this is the three dimensional representation of the bar and the ring, it should be here, right? So this is our main concern. This is our main part of this ring that we are interested in finding the forces acting on it in addition to the, to the stresses. So if the bar of the ring has a diameter of two inches, the word diameter indicated that this bar has a circular cross section. We said that the cross section is needed for the calculation of the stresses as we discussed over the previous video. It means that this cross section of the bar, this cross section of the bar, it has a diameter. It is a circular, uh, cir circular with a diameter. The diameter of this bar is given by two inches. We said that inch bound, these are the units that could be used for the US customary unit system for identifying the units for different physical quantities according to the American system. So no, it doesn't matter whatever the unit system, it is metric or international unit system or US unit system, the procedure or the solution will be the same. So the bar has this diameter of two inches and it is made of steel. So this is the material and it, this is steel has a Young's modulus. We said that this Young's modulus, which is E, the Young's modulus of the bar is given by 16,000 PSI, PSI, this is the unit for the Young's modulus, and we're gonna discuss, also we discussed these units over the previous video, special for the stresses, but we're gonna discuss it also with more detail here. But anyway, the Young's modulus was given by 600,000, uh, six, uh, 16,000 PSI, which is, uh, uh, material property for this steel. It means that the steel had this value of the Young's modulus. If we change it, the material of this part for some reason, it means that this Young's modulus definitely is going to change. But these are the material specification and the geometry. As we discussed over the previous video, the stress is related to the strengths. And both, they are related to the material type and the geometry or the dimensions or the size of the object. So the, the size or the geometry is defined by the two inches diameter. In addition, the material has been defined by the 16,000 PSI as a Young's modulus. What are the requirements? The first requirement that is required to calculate the magnitude and direction of the total resultant force acting on the stress. 
on the ring. So it is required to calculate the resultant force. We said that the force resultant is just to combine all of these three forces into one component. So what is this single component? What, what is its magnitude and direction? This is what have been covered before when we discussed the force analysis. So this is part A or the requirement A and let us start with this part. So here we're just gonna work over the force resultant. Nothing will be new in comparison to what we have discussed before. We, your objective, this is just a practice, a revision. So your objective is just to apply the procedure that we mentioned before. So the first step, if you remember, if you recall the step, the step one is just to decompose all the forces, decompose forces. Forces. All the forces that are inclined into two components, one is parallel to the x-axis, the second one is parallel to the y-axis. We had considered this example before. So for example, this force, it is inclined force with an angle 45 degree that is defined with the vertical axis. So we have to decompose this force into two component, one horizontal and one vertical. The same thing for F2, but F3, there is no need to do decomposition for this force because it is, it is already horizontal in the horizontal direction. And this is what I'm gonna do. So I'm just gonna start with the ring. So let us assume that this is the ring that we have here and your objective is just to decompose all the forces into two components starting with the F1. So if this is the force F1 as already given by 800 bound and this angle was specified to this force by 45 degrees. So it will be decomposed into two forces. One force will be horizontal force in this direction and the other force will be vertical as we discussed before, right? Both they should be projected out of the point, the same thing like this resultant force or this total force of 800. And this horizontal force, which one is gonna take the sine, which one is gonna take the cosine? We said that the sine goes to the, si to the side that is adjacent to the angle. This angle it is confined between the force and this vertical component. So this vertical component is, stay, is gonna take the cosine, but the sine is gonna go to this horizontal component. It means that this component will be 800 cosine the 45 degrees. But this component will be 800 the sine of the 45 degrees. Now I can cancel this force. Why? Because I've decomposed this force into two components, one horizontal and one vertical. Do the same for the other force, force, which is F2. So F2 it is directed, this is the direction of F2. This is the F2. And it was given by 350 bounds. And this force, this angle was defined by 20 between the vertical and the force itself. It means also it will be decomposed into two components. It will be decomposed into two components. One will be vertical and the other one, one will be horizontal in this way to squeeze or confine this F2 in between these two sides, these two components, one vertical, one horizontal, and both they should be projected of the same point. This one is projected up, this one is projected left, doing the same action at the F2. So which one of these two components that is gonna take the cosine, the horizontal or vertical, definitely is gonna be the vertical. Why? Because the vertical component is the one that is close or adjacent to the angle, 20 degrees. This angle is confined between the force and this vertical component. It means that this one is gonna take the cosine of the same angle, which is 20, and the force magnitude is 350. So it's gonna be 350 cosine 20, but here it's gonna be 350. Automatic is gonna take this sine. The other force take the sine, and now we can cancel this resultant force. So we decompose the F1, we decompose the F2. How about the F3? There is no need to do any decomposition to F3. Why? Because it is already decomposed. It is already horizontal with 150 bound to the left as already represented into this figure here. So at the end, after this decomposition, we're gonna end up with three forces located in the horizontal direction. One is going to the right, the other two going left, and we do have another two components who are directed upward, going up in the vertical direction. So this is a step one. And a step two, if you recall the procedure for the calculation of the force result, and in step two, is just to sum the forces, sum the forces in the horizontal direction and the in X direction. And then we're gonna sum also in the Y direction. 
Make sense? So as for this step, as for this step, so if I ask you to calculate the sum of the forces along x direction, how many forces do I have parallel to x? We do have three forces. We said that it is, you can assume any direction is positive, the other direction definitely it will be negative. So let us assume that any force going in the positive x direction, because if we assume that this is the x direction and this is the y direction, this it means that any force going in the positive x direction is going to be positive, any force going to the negative x direction is going to be negative. This is the simplest way. So the sum of these forces, this 800, 800 sine, 45 degrees, it's gonna be positive y going to the right in the same positive x direction, but these two forces will be negative. So we're gonna have negative 350, the sine of 20 degrees, negative the 150 force. Your objective then is just to calculate this value. So the 800, the sine of 45 degree, this gives us 565.68 negative, the 350 sine the 20 degrees, this is gonna give us the 119.7, negative 150. So if you sum this, you're gonna end up with this value, which 565.68, this is gonna give us at the end 295.97. What should be the unit? Then it should be bound. We should, we said that you just gonna use the same force, the same unit of the force as defined here. All forces were given in pounds, so you're gonna use pound. If they were given in Newton, you're gonna use Newton, the same unit, make sense? So this is for the horizontal component, this is for the sum of the forces parallel to X, you're gonna do the same, the sum of the forces parallel to Y. Um, an important thing, you have to observe the sign. The sign here, it is positive. What does it mean positive? It means that it is directed, the direction of this force, it, is, it goes in the positive X direction. This is the direction of that force. How about the sum of the forces parallel to y? We have two components. Both are directed up, and according to this positive definition of the y-axis, it means that um, we're gonna consider that these two components are positive. So the 350 cosine 20 and 800 cosine 45 both are positive. 350 cosine 20 degrees plus the 800 cosine 45 degrees both are positive. Then your objective is just to calculate the sum of these two components. So simply we're gonna say that this term, this term will be definitely 565.68, which is 800 cosine because the cosine of 45 equal the cosine, the sine of 45. So we just need to calculate the 350 times the cosine of 20. This is gonna give us the 328.89. Then your objective is just to sum these two values. You're gonna end up with the 894 point 57 bounds. Why bounds? Because we are still using the same unit as already given to us for the force. So this is for step two. We remember that we're still working over the requirement A, which is the force analysis or the force resultant. Force resultant, it means that you should decompose the forces. Step two, sum the forces parallel to X and Y. Then step three, your objective is just to calculate the step three, Step three, your objective is just calculate the, the magnitude and direction of the force resultant that we already have. We said that that is fine since we already sum. We can call this sum of forces parallel to X as Fx or Frx and this sum of forces parallel to y as f r y. So this is the resultant force in the y direction, resultant force in the x direction. Now we can calculate the magnitude. So the magnitude of the resultant force equals, we said that these two bars indicating the magnitude of the resultant force it should equal to the square root of the f r x square plus the f r y square, the resultant force along x square plus the along y square. It means that your objective is just to square this value and square this value under the square root, you're gonna end up with the magnitude. So the magnitude will be the square root of 295.97 squared plus the 894.57 squared. Under the square root, then your objective is just to calculate the magnitude of the resultant force something in pound. So this is gonna give us, this is squared plus the 295.97 squared 
under the square root, this is going to give us the, okay, 894.50 squared plus the 295.97 squared under the square root. This is going to give us 942.26 pounds. So this is the magnitude of the force, the resultant force. How about the direction? The direction of the force, we said that we are going to specify this direction by the angle theta, which should be the angle between the positive x direction and the force itself, which can be simply calculated as the tan inverse, the tangent inverse of the FRY. FRY, the Y component divided by the X component all the time. Since we're already defining this theta with respect to the X axis, you guys just gonna choose the Y component divided by the X component. This is gonna give us the tan inverse of, and you should consider the sign. We are likely that both forces are positive, no problem. So you're just gonna plug the FY over the FX. So this is gonna give us the 894 point 57 FRY divided by the 295.97. Then your objective is just to calculate the angle theta. So this is gonna give us the tan inverse. Tan inverse over the calculator, calculator is the shift of the tangent. Then you're just gonna press on the tangent key and you're gonna have the 894.57 divided by the 295.97. Uh, and then you're just going to calculate the angle by 71.69 degrees. If you got it negative, that's fine. Put it negative, the same sign as you got it. I got it here positive, so I'm just plug it, it positive as already I got it over the, the calculator. I said that there are some other steps that should be done after this to identify correctly the direction of the resultant force, but this is not the subject or the objective of this course. As I mentioned, the objective is just to give you an overview what does it mean a force resultant magnitude and direction. And this is what we have done, and this is the thing that will be required from you for point A. Make sense? For point B, it is required to calculate the normal stress acting of the bar, acting on the bar of the of the ring. So the bar, which is this part, as I said, this bar it will have this cylindrical shape with a diameter which is given by two inches. As we discussed before, the stress can be calculated from a force. Any force will produce a stress, and this stress it could be a normal stress or a shear stress. The normal stress is the stress that is produced from a force that is perpendicular to the cross section. This bar has a circular cross section and it has two directions, two main directions. One is parallel direction and the other one is perpendicular to the, to the cross section. Here we got two forces. One force we combined, we do have in total three forces, but we have combined them into two components, right? Into two forces. One is parallel to X, which 295. So this FRX, it means that this is the sum of these three forces. This is the sum of all the forces that are horizontal, uh, horizontal in the horizontal direction. And FRY, these are the sum of the forces that who are vertical. Like we replaced these three forces who are inclined, some of them are inclined forces, and we decompose this, them into two components, one horizontal, one vertical, and that's it. Make sense? So we're gonna make use of this FRX and FRY. So, and these forces who are acting on the ring definitely or indirectly, they do affect on the bar itself. They do have another effect over the bar. So your objective is just to calculate this normal stress, this is the requirement B, what should be the normal stress? In the meanwhile, I'm gonna discuss the shear stress acting on the bar of the ring. So we need to calculate the normal stress and the shear stress. So now I'm skipping, for now, the normal strain. Forget about the normal strain, just focus on the normal stress and the shear stress that could be produced because of these three forces acting on the bar. We said that the force will produce a stress. This stress could be normal, could be shear, could be both, depending on the force. So this force, it will produce normal stress and shear stress, how much they are acting on the ring. So since the ring is the thing that we are seeking the stresses or acting or, or produce within this bar, so what we're going to do, and this is the requirement B, and requirement B it is required to calculate these stresses. So I'm just going to work over the stress or in general, let us work over this is B and 
requirement B and D, which are the normal and shear stresses. So I'm just going to calculate the normal and, and shear stresses at once. We said that in a normal stress, whatever it is in general, it could be positive or negative, the force at, divided by the area, right? And the shear stress, it could be the F divided by one area or two areas, whatever it is, single shear or double shear, as we discussed over the previous video, right? So these are the two expressions that we should use for the calculation of the normal stress and the shear stress. Sigma, this is normal stress. Tau, this is shear stress. But we should investigate these things over the bar of the ring. So this is the bar and which should be fixed. And this is the cross section of this circular bar. This cross section, it is circular with a diameter given by two inches. Make sense? So now we have decomposed these forces into two components, one horizontal, that is FRX, and we get it positive. Positive, it means that it goes in the positive X direction. And the other one is vertical in the positive y direction. Why positive y direction? Because we got it positive as well. But for some reason, if we got this force negative, so it should be directed down. So the first thing, and this is very important thing that you have to do in order to investigate, because we don't have two forces, one horizontal, one vertical. This indicates one of them, one of these two forces will produce normal stress. The other one will produce shear stress. But the question is, which one will produce normal stress? Which one will produce shear stress? This is the tricky part. So how we can identify these forces? Your objective is just to consider this bar. So this bar, this is the three-dimensional representation of the bar. If you are interested to work in three dimension, if you are interested to work in two dimension, the bar, it will be shown here. But something that you should understand that it is fixed, this is the ring of the bar, as we discussed. And we got two forces acting over this bar. One force is in the X direction, and it was in positive X direction, FRX. And the other force was in positive Y direction, which is FRY. It means that FRX, it should be going right. FRY should be going up. Why? Because we got both positive. If we got this one is negative, so it should be directed left. If we got this one is negative, it should be directed down according to this coordinate system that we normally or conventionally assume. Make sense? If we are working in three dimension, this typically is going to be in this way. Like you do have one force going to the right FRX and the other force going up in the FRY. So if I ask you which one, and remember that we already got FRX equals 295 point something, right? 97 bounds, and we already got the FRY by this value 894, 94.57, yes, 57 bounds. Make sense? So these are the two forces. Which one, this is the tricky part, which one will produce a normal stress and which one will produce a shear stress? So let us calculate the normal stress. Which one of these two forces, you should consider the cross section. This is the cross section. The question is, which one of these two forces is parallel to the cross section? If Rx or if Ry, if Rx, it is parallel to the cross section. But which one is normal to the cross section? The if Ry, this is the cross section. If Rx, it is parallel, conceded over the cross section. But if Ry, it is normal to the cross section. We said that the normal stress comes from the normal force, the force that is perpendicular to the cross section. It means that the F, the sigma should be produced for this example, just for this example, from the FRY, divided by the area of this cross section, which is a circular area. Very simple. Then you should understand or identify the sign. Whatever it is, positive or negative, depending on what, depending on the type of this force. This FRY, is it positive or negative? Is it tension or compression? The tendency of the FRY here, it is tension. Why tension? Because it is projected out of the, coming out, projected out of the cross section. This is the cross section and the force going up, projected from the cross section. So it should be positive, it should indicate that this is a tensile stress. 
But in case that you got, for some reason, for another problem, if you got this FRY negative here, you should investigate its direction over the graph here first. And then if you switch the direction of FRY, it will be directed down going into. I'm not, I don't care whatever it goes up or down. I care about the cross section. If the force projected from the cross section it should be positive. If it is going to the cross section, it's gonna be negative. I don't care about the direction of the force itself, but I care about the force with respect to the cross section. Is it projected or going into the cross section? If it is going into the cross section, it will be negative, it will be compression. If it is projected, it will be positive. For example, I'm just gonna give you a very quick example. How about if we don't have the bar Fix it from the top. This bar here, it is fixed blue from down. But here, instead of fixing the bar from the bottom surface, it would be fixed from the top. And in that case, assume that this is the cross section. This is the circular cross section, it is down. Not from the top, it is down. And in that case, we don't have the FRY in this direction. As you can see, FRY going down, I don't care but it is projected from the cross section. It comes out of the cross section. It is projected from the cross section. This indicates that it is tension. So for this case, it will be tension, it should be positive. But if it is going up, for this case, it will be going into the cross section. Going into the cross section, it means that it should be compression. So identifying the sign of the sigma, does it def uh, the identification of the sign doesn't depend on the direction of the force? No, it depends on the force direction with respect to the cross section. Is it going into the cross section to be negative, or is it projected out of the cross section? It's going to be positive. Here, it is projected from the cross section, so it means that it should be positive force equals positive. The FRY we already got it by 894.57 divided by the cross section. What is the cross section of any circle from the high school? It, the, with a given diameter, if the diameter of the circle was given, the area in terms of the diameter will be pi over four, pi over four, the diameter is square. So again, if the diameter of the circle was given, the area of the circular, the, uh, the circular area for a given diameter, it is pi over four, the diameter is square. But in case that the radius is the thing that was given instead of the diameter, how about if I give you the radius r? So r, this is the radius. But here d stands for the diameter. As you know from the high school, the diameter, it is double the radius. It is 2r. d equals 2r. In case that the radius was given and you are interested in calculating this cross-sectional area in terms of the radius, so it should be pi r squared. So in terms of the radius will be pi r squared. In terms of the diameter will be pi over 4. You should add this quarter in case that you are dealing with the diameter. Here, he gave us the diameter by 2 inches. You can convert it into radius and use the, the formula for the area as pi r squared, or you can plug it as, as it as it is given by 2 inches. So this is the diameter was given by 2 inches for this circular area. It means that you can directly calculate the area to be pi over 4, the 2 diameter square. The diameter was given by 2 inches, so this is going to give us 894.57 divided by pi over 4, the diameter which was given by 2 inches square. Then your objective is just to use the calculator to calculate the normal stress. So this is going to give us the normal stress equals positive. Why positive? In, because this is a tensile force projected out of this cross section. And then your objective is just to calculate the uh, diameter, the, this value, which will be 894.57 divided by pi. 57, 84.57 divided by pi over 4 times the diameter square. This is going to give us the 2800. Uh, 284.77, what, 75, what should be the unit of the stress? As we discussed over the last video, the stress, it is a force which was given in pound divided by the area. The area, it is inch. The diameter was given in inch, so the area will be inch squared because you already squaring this 
pi over 4 has no unit. It's just a number, a factor. But 2, this is the diameter, and it is squared. So it should be 2 inches squared. So it is over an inch squared. Bound over inch squared, this is equivalent to the PSI, as we discussed the last video over the, in terms of the unit, in case that we are using the American unit system. So the bound divided by inch squared, this is equivalent to the PSI. This is something that you should understand. Make sense? So this is simply how we can calculate the normal stress. And we just calculate from the FRY. Why this was the force that is normal to the cross section? How about the shear stress? Definitely, intuitively, the shear stress would be from the other force because the normal force is only one force. There is no possibility to have for any solid part, for any mechanical component, whatever it is. It cannot have two normals. It has only one normal, but it can have multiple parallel. It means that you may have multiple forces who are parallel to the cross section, but the force that is normal to the cross section is going to be only one force, one component. So we got this normal, it means that this FR will be parallel. And we discussed over the last video that any force that is parallel to the cross section will produce a stress. The type of this stress will be shear stress, which is tau. This tau will be the force over area or double area, in case that would have single shear or double, or, or double shear. For this bar, we do have a single shear case. Why single shear? Because the force it is parallel to the cross section and only one cross section is going to be sliced. Assuming that this force is big enough to cut this bar or to slice this bar. So this bar will be sliced from only one single area. So that's why, or one single surface. So that's why it is a single shear case. So that's why we're gonna use or define the tail, which is the shear stress the shear stress tau definitely will be the FRX, the other force, divided by one single area. Make sense? So this is the shear stress, this is the normal stress, equals. The FRX, we already got it by, and we said that we don't care about the sign. We didn't discuss the sign of the shear stress, so we don't care what is the exact direction uh, of this force with respect to the cross section. We don't care about this thing for here. But anyway, this sign thing will be considered and discussed in, the, in details in the mechanics of material class as we mentioned. So the FRX is 295.97. This is the FRX 295.97. Uh, divided by the cross section, which is pi over four, the diameter, which is two squared, the same cross section area that we already calculated before. So this is gonna give us the 295.97 divided by shift pi. This is gonna give us 94.21. What should be the unit? Again, it will be bound divided by inch square, which is equivalent to the PSI, the same unit of the normal stress that we calculated before. So this is the normal stress, which is tensile stress, and this is the shear stress, which we don't care about its sign. Make sense? So this is for the requirement B. And D, it was required here to calculate the normal stress acting on the bar of, of the ring and the shear stress acting on the bar of the ring. And this is the cross-sectional area of the bar. Now, how about the normal stress? We said that the force, it will produce the formation and the strain and the stresses, right? Now we calculated the stresses due to the force, the normal stress and the shear stress. But in the meanwhile, the force can produce a stress, a strain, had produced strain. So there is a strain there, how we can calculate it. Also, there is a deformation, we can calculate it as well. But why did we start with the stress, or we are more interested with the stresses? As we mentioned over the last video, the stress it is a more accurate measure to identify how severely this water ring are affected by these three forces. The best measure is the stress, so that's why the focus is more over the stresses. But how about for some reason, if we are interested in calculating the strain, so what is the normal strain that acting over this bar, this normal strain, so what is normal strain? It means that the strain itself, it could be normal or shear. This is something also that you should understand, but anyway, this will be discussed again with more detail in the mechanics of material class and other courses. That the strain, it could be normal strain or shear strain, like the stresses exactly. We have normal stress and shear stress. 
All right, so the normal strain, it can be calculated directly from the deformation. We can get the normal strain from the deformation. As, as we said, there is delta over L, as we discussed the last video, or it could be calculated from the stresses through the Hoax law. So just to write, I'm just gonna write these two expressions to you and let you know how we can, are going to calculate the normal stress. We said that the stress, or I'm sorry, the strain, and this is the requirement number, or the, requir uh, uh, the requirement C. This is point C. It is required to calculate the normal, normal strain. As we discussed the last video, we said that the normal strain, which is epsilon, we used to define this normal strain as epsilon, it could be calculated as delta over L according from the deformation, where this delta, this is the deformation, which stands like the elongation into this bar. This bar will be subjected to, to some forces. One of these forces were, was normal force, which is FRY, as we discussed above, and this force, the tendency of this force is just to stretch this bar. It means that this bar will be elongated with a certain amount delta. If you divided this delta over the original length of the bar, you're gonna end up with the normal strain. But the problem in this example, we have no clue how much is delta, how much of elongation that this bar will produce or this force will produce into this bar. Also, we don't have the original length of the bar. It means that the calculation of the normal strain through this expression, it is not possible. Why? There are lots of information who are, which, has, which, are, which is measure, uh, missing into this case. We have no clue how much is delta, how much is, how much is the value of the original, original length of the bar. He didn't give us of the of the bar this value it means that we will not be able to calculate the normal strain but we do have the hoax law hoax law said that the normal stress can be related to the normal strain through the young's modulus which is already given to us this is the strain that we are interested in calculating it and this is the normal stress we are seeking we can refer to the normal stress the question is if there is a relation between, because as we discussed, the strain, it could be normal or shear. The stress, it is normal or shear. So it means that according to Hooke's law, Hooke's law relates, the convention or the classical Hooke's law relates the normal stress to the normal strain. Can we relate the shear stress to the shear strain, which is the other type of strain? Yes, we can. There is some relation, but as I said, this will not be covered into this course because this will be discussed in detail in the mechanics of material class. This is what you are going to study in the mechanics of material class. But generally speaking, we have normal stress and normal strain. And we have shear stress and shear strain are all are related to each other. Make sense? According to the simplest form or relation between stress and strain is the normal stress and the normal strain. And the normal strain according to the Hooke's law and this E, this is the Young's modulus. And this is the one that we do have information at. Now we calculated the normal stress. We already calculated sigma. We got it. In addition, the epsilon was given to us. I'm sorry, the E, the Young's modulus was given to us. The Young's modulus was given by 16,000 PSI. It means that simply if we divided the stress by the Young's modulus, we can simply end up with the strain, one step. So this strain, epsilon, it is simply sigma over E according to this relation. Divide both sides by E, you're gonna end up with this expression. How much is sigma that we calculated? We got it by this value, 284.75 PSI, which is bound over inch square. So it is 284.75 PSI divided by the E, the Young's model, which is given by 16,000 PSI. The BSI can be canceled with the BSI. You can cancel the unit. This indicates why this strain is dimensionless. This is dimensionless. It means that has no unit as we discussed the last uh, video. Make sense? So this is gonna give us, if you divide these two numbers, you're gonna end up with 284.75 divided by 16,000. This gonna give us the strain, which could be a small value at this one, 0 0.0178 
And again, it is dimensionless. Don't put any unit to the strain. It is. It has no dimension. This indicates that this bar, because of the force, will be strained in the normal direction or normal strain will be 0 0.0178 as a strain. And that's it for this example. It was required to calculate the resultant force. And this is what we have done over the uh, step one or requirement A. Then we calculated the normal stress and the shear stress. Then we calculated the normal strain from the Hooke's law. Make sense? All right, this exercise two is very similar to exercise one. But the only different thing is that this force if it is unknown. There in the previous example, all the forces were known, were given. We knew all the values for the forces, but here we have one of the forces is unknown. It means that we should do force analysis by finding this unknown force, then we can, we can find, calculate the stresses and the strain and the other things. But this requires that we should apply one of the, <coughs> apply the Newton's second law of the static equilibrium because this object, this ring, it definitely it will not be moving, right? It is stationary. It means that we should know how we can apply the uh, Newton's uh, second law to this problem. So the following ring is subjected to, this ring is subjected to a set of three forces represented as given if the bar of the ring has a diameter of 25 millimeter. So the bar of the ring has a diameter, diameter indicating that this is a circular, the same bar, we do have the same bar, which is circular, fix it to the ground, in this way or the platform in that way and this is the cross section this cross section has a diameter over the previous example it was an inch but here the diameter is it is given by 25 millimeters so we are switching to the metric system or the uh, international unit system the solution will not be different almost it's going to be the same procedure and even the forces here, this force is 410 Newton, and this is 200 Newton. This angle is 10 degrees, this is 30 degrees, this is 45 degrees. But this force is F, which is unknown. We have no clue how much it is, okay? Forget about the diameter value. The diameter was given by 25 millimeter. And it is made of a steel of a Young's modulus given by 200, 210 gigapascal. So the Young's modulus E was given by 210 gigapascal. This is for the... Uh, Young's modulus. The requirement A, calculate the magnitude, find the magnitude of the unknown force F that makes the net, this is the condition, this thing here, that makes the net force along the X direction is zero. This is the condition. To find any unknown force, you should apply a condition. You should apply an equation. You need an equation. This equation required should be defined based on a based on a condition, based on an, inequ an inequ uh, equilibrium condition, like the Newton's second law of the static equilibrium. So the requirement here, or the condition is that the sum of the forces along the X direction should be zero. The net force, the net force, this is the sum of the forces. Along the X direction, it should be zero. This is for requirement A. The difference between this requirement and the previous example is the requirement A in the previous example. There we were required to calculate the resultant forces because the resultant force, because all the forces were given. But here we do have one of the forces is unknown. It means that we should apply the procedure of finding the unknown force as we explained over the previous videos. So um, we're gonna start here with requirement A, which is finding, find, finding the unknown, unknown force which is A, F. So how we can find this force? Let us apply the procedure as usual. Step one is decompose, decompose all forces. All forces, especially the forces which are inclined. All forces are inclined in that case. So it means that we have to do decomposition to all of them. So let us draw the ring. This is the ring that we have. And forget about the bar for now, we're just interested in finding the decomposition of these forces. So this force is F, and in addition to this force, let us just move this one a little bit down so we can have room to draw the other forces. So this is the ring. And we can have, this is the first force, F1. I'm sorry, this is F, the unknown force which is inclined to the vertical direction with an angle 45 degree. So definitely this will be decomposed into two components. One component will be horizontal, 
force and the other one will be vertical as we discussed before and both will be projected from the same point doing the same behavior like this force and this definitely is going to take the cosine because this is the closest to the angle so this is going to give us the f cosine 45 degrees but this one will be the f sine 45 degrees and in that case we can cancel this force so we decompose the first force do the same for the 400 newton force the other force which is this one it is inclined in that in this direction 410 newton force and its angle is 30 degrees so this angle it belongs because this is the angle between the force and the vertical axis so it means that we can decompose this force into two components as well as already given in this case let us use the, this color so it will give us one component horizontal the other component will be vertical squeezing and confining this angle between this force between these two forces and this is this side or this component is close this is the closest to the angle it means it's going to take the cosine so this force will be 410 cosine the 30 degrees and this one is going to take the sine so it will be the 410 sine the 30 degrees force then we can cancel this force the same thing now we can have the third force which is this force that already this 200 it is somehow between the 400 and this horizontal direction it is 200 newton force and it has an angle 10 degrees with the horizontal axis again this component it will be this force will be decomposed into two components one will be horizontal going to the left and the other one will be vertical going up in that case make sense so this one, this is the horizontal component, the one that is going to take the cosine. Why? Because the 10 degrees, it is confined between this force and the horizontal component. So this is going to take the 200, the cosine of 10 degrees, and then we can cancel this one, but the other one is going to take the 200, the sine of the 10 degrees. So now we got these forces. In total, we decompose these three forces into three forces horizontal and three other forces vertical. Then step two, if you remember, if, even typically as we have done over the previous example, typically the same procedure over the previous example, in step two, your objective is just to sum the forces, sum the forces along the horizontal direction and the vertical direction. So the sum of the forces along the horizontal direction, how much it is? So the sum of forces along the x-axis direction, we have three components. One of them is positive, why it goes to the right, the other two components are negative, assuming that the right direction is the positive direction. So this is gonna give us the F sine, 45 degrees, the force F, we have no clue how much it is. So carry on the F as it is, deal with it like it is a number. It is unknown, yes, but deal with it like it is a number and it is positive, negative. This 410 sine 30 degrees, negative the 200, the cosine of 10 degrees. Then your objective is just this value, we have no clue how much it is. So it is F sine 45 degrees, get on this value as it is. Negative, then your objective is just to sum these two values. So this is going to give us 401 point. 96 this is the sum of these two negative values equals something or forget about equals for now so this is the sum of the forces parallel to x then we're just gonna sum the forces parallel to y as well so this is gonna give us how many forces do i have parallel to y we have three forces all of them are directed up it means that all of them will be positive so we're gonna have f cosine 45 degrees plus the 410 cosine 30 and the 200 sine 10 so this is gonna give us the f cosine 45 degrees positive plus the 410 cosine the 30 degrees plus the 200 the sine of 10 degrees these are the sum of these three forces in the y direction now we're going to do the same the f cosine 45 degree we have no clue how much is the f so we're just going to carry on this term and we're just going to sum the other terms so 410 times the cosine of 300 uh, three de 30 degrees plus the 200 sine the 10 degrees this is going to give us 389.8 389.8 389 force make sense 
As we discussed, if we are interested in calculating the resultant force, we said that we give a name to this one as FRX, and this is the force which is FRY, if we are calculating the resultant forces. But here, we are not interested in this resultant forces, but the first requirement is required to find this unknown force F. But there is a condition that should be given. Usually, we have considered this thing before. How about, for example, if this angle theta, this angle 45 degree was not given? Here he gave us this angle 45 degree. So, but if the angle, this angle 45 degree was given at theta, it means that it is unknown. So we're going to end up with two unknowns. So that's why we shall apply the Newton's static equilibrium to both the sum of forces. We're just going to put this sum of forces value to x equals zero. And the sum of force here will equal zero. This is going to give us two equations and two unknowns. But here, we have only one unknown. This unknown is F. The angle was given. The angle was given by 45 degrees. So it means that we are seeking the magnitude of this unknown force. How much it is? It is only one unknown, so we need only one equation. So that's why he should specify a condition here. This condition that this force should be identified in such a way that the net forces the net of the force, the net force in the x direction should be zero. This is the condition that the sum of the forces along the x direction should be zero. It means that this sum of forces, it should be zero. So this is gonna give us an equation. This is an equation that should be solved for only one unknown, which is F. Make sense? So your objective, so this is gonna give us the equation one. Now we're just gonna solve the equation and this will be step three. So step three, solve step Three, solve the static equilibrium, static equilibrium condition for F. This is your objective is just to solve equation one for F. So equation one is said that the F sine 45 degrees negative, this value which is 401 point 96 equals zero. So for this equation, we have only one unknown which can be simply solved by lin solving a linear equation from mathematics. Your objective is just to move this one to the other side with a and switch the sign. Then you're going to divide by the sign 45. So this is going to give us F sine 45 degrees. I just move this one to be positive on the other side point 96. Then I'm just going to divide both sides by the sign 45 degrees, sine 45 degrees. Then this sign will be canceled. This is going to give us at the end the force equals this value. How much it is? So it is 401.96 divided by the sine of 45 degrees. This is going to give us the 568.46. What should be the unit? It should be Newton. Why Newton the force? It is in Newton. Why? Because all the forces were given in Newton in the original problem. Make sense? So this is for requirement A. We found the unknown force. For requirement B and C, it is required to calculate the normal stresses acting on the bar due to these forces. For B and C, these are normal stress and shear stresses. We said that the force will reduce normal and shear stresses how much they are. So in total, we should have two forces, right? We said that this force is going to be FRX and this is FRY. This is the one of these forces will produce normal stress. The other one will produce shear stress. Make sense for this case. But there is something which is you should understand here that we put a condition. We enforce the condition over that the sum of the forces who are parallel to X should be zero, right? We found the value of F that made the sum of the forces along X equals zero. What does it mean this? This means that automatically if our X became zero, we have put this constraint, we have applied this condition, we found F that makes F R X zero. This was as was given or required here. So intuitively, this directly, so when we move to requirement B and C and D, so requirement B and D, which are the normal, and shear stresses.
To calculate these stresses, we should know how much is the value of F of FRX and FRY, as we have done before over the previous example, right? FRX here will be zero. Why zero? Why zero? Because he gave us a constraint over the X forces. The net forces along X direction should be zero. He gave us this constraint. So we have to comply with this constraint. We have to consider it. It means that this F F FRX, by definition, has already given it is zero. We still need to calculate the FRY. Make sense? So if R X it is zero, if R Y we got it with this expression. This is if R Y. It is F, which we just calculated, cosine 45 plus 3, 189.8. So let us calculate the F R Y. It is F the cosine or the sine. It is the cosine of the 45 degrees plus 389.8. Make sense? How much is F? If we got it by this value, which is 568.46 times the cosine of 45 degrees plus the 389.8, this is the how we can calculate this FRX, FRY. So let us calculate it. Just sum these values times the cosine or the cosine of 45 degrees plus the 389.8. This is gonna give us in total 791.76. So this is, and the unit is gonna be Newton definitely. It means that, this means that the FRX, the net force is parallel to X, it is zero because this is a constraint or a condition that we have to comply with. And we do have the FRY, we got it by 791.76. Now, if you do have this bar, we are interested in calculating the normal and shear stresses acting over this bar. This bar. This bar will be subjected into two forces. One is if Rx, which is zero, and the other one is if Ry. So this is the bar that is fixed to the ground, down from the lower surface, and this is the surface that we are you gonna use for investigating who is normal, who is parallel to the surface. We should have two forces. One force, which is FRX, but unfortunately it is zero, or we are like it is zero, so this one will be canceled. And the other force, which is 791.76, and it is positive. Positive, it means that it should be directed in the positive X direction as FRY, which we got it by this value. So if I ask you how much is the normal stress? The sigma. Sigma should equal to positive. Why positive? Because if our wire is normal and it is projected out of the surface, so it should be positive. The normal force is if our y divided by the area of this cross section, which equals, we got this value by 791.76 divided by the area, which is pi over four. The diameter is square. We said that the area of the circle, it is pi over four, the diameter is square. The diameter of this bar was given by 25 millimeter. So it will be the diameter of this bar will be 25 millimeter square. If we do the calculation, this is gonna give us 700 divided by 25, 25 shift pi times four. If we do this calculation, we're gonna end up with 1.6129. This is the value. What should be the unit? So this is the normal stress. The unit it should be the force was given in Newton and the area it is millimeter squared. We said that there is no unit for the pi over four. So it's gonna be millimeter because this 25 was given in millimeter squared. The Newton over millimeter squared, this is equivalent to the mega pascal. It is equivalent to the mega pascal. This is something important that you should understand about this stress. So this is for the normal stress. This is the normal stress and this is the requirement B. But for the requirement D, the shear stress, 
which we agreed that we're gonna give it the symbol tau, it should equal to the force over one single area, a single shear, not double shear. Typically the same like the previous example. But which force it should be the FRX? We said that one of these two forces, either FRX or FRY, one it should be, it's gonna be used for making a normal stress, the other one is gonna do a shear stress. The, the critical part is that you should understand which one is normal to the surface. The normal to the surface, it should be normal, will produce sigma, and the parallel to the surface will produce a shear. So the FRX is zero already, so we're gonna end up with this value as zero. So it means that there is no shear stress that will be acting over this part. It is only normal stress, as long as we are interested in applying this or considering this condition that the net force parallel to X is zero. The last requirement is C, which is the normal strain epsilon of the bar. We said that the normal strain could be calculated from the deformation, but unfortunately we do not have any, any information regarding the deformation or the original length of the bar. The other option just to use the Hooke's law. And this is what we are going to use for the requirement C. So requirement C, the normal strain, how we can calculate this normal strain. So simply, we said that according to Hooke's law, the sigma equals E times epsilon, the Young's modulus times epsilon, which is the strain. So what should be the epsilon then? It will be sigma divided by E. We got the normal stress by 1.6129. Divided by, and this is very tricky, that you should consider the units here. You should consider a unit conversion. Remember that this one was given in megapascal. This is the stress. So it is 1.6129 megapascal, which is Newton over millimeter square. You should understand it that it is equivalent to megapascal divided by the Young's modulus. The Young's modulus was given to us by 210 gigapascal. This is a difference. There is a difference in the unit. So it is 210 gigapascal. This is the Young's modulus. So if we gonna go down again, to this one, it is 210 gigapascal. The giga doesn't match or fit with the mega. You should ha achieve consistency into these two units. Whatever to convert the giga into mega or the mega into giga. How we can convert? You should apply the procedure that we discussed before regarding the units. We said that this G uppercase and M uppercase, these are B fixes. The main unit it is Pascal. So it means that in order to get rid of the giga and replace it with the mega, you should do something. To get rid of any prefix, you're gonna multiply by its value. So if I decided to do this simply, I'm going, I, I would like to convert this one into Pascal divided by Pascal. It means that from the top, I need to get rid of the Mega, I need to get rid of the uppercase M. From the table, the mega it is equivalent to 10 to the power six. You're gonna multiply times 10 power six on the top, divided by the giga it is equivalent to the 10 power nine. In the denominator, you're gonna multiply it times 10 to the power nine in the denominator to get rid of G. So I need to get rid of G, get rid of M, so I'm gonna end up with Pascal over Pascal. It means that this value, it will be multiplied times 10 to the power six divided by 10 to the power nine in the denominator, which you can cancel this one with this one to end up with 10 power three only. Make sense? And this is what we're gonna do. So what you just gonna calculate, so this is gonna give us at the end, the epsilon, the strain equals, calculate 1.6129 divided by 210. This is gonna give us 7.68 times this value only, this is gonna give us 7.68 times 10 to the power negative three. This is, this is the value. This is the only value that we're gonna get from the calculator. Then we are going to multiply times here, this 10 over six divided by 10 over three, which is gonna be one over 10 over three, because this six will be canceled with the three, uh, nine, this is gonna give us three. If you done this, will be canceled with the 10 negative three. So we're gonna end up that the strain at the end, the strain will be simply by 768. This is gonna be the strain and it will be dimensionless. Why? Because the Pascal will be canceled with the Pascal. 
So simply, this is the normal strain that is going to be produced over this part. Because of what? Because of the applied forces. It will produce a normal strain of 7.68, which is a very huge strain, and the stress will be 1.6129 Newton over millimeter square. Make sense? So this is simply how we can calculate the stresses and the strain for this example, for in case that one of the forces is unknown. All right, so this example number three, it is related to the force analysis of the bearings. We said that one of the essential steps, or the first step actually, that you should do in order to do design for any mechanical component is just to do force analysis. Force analysis, it means that to calculate the forces that would be acting over this component. So, we said that bearings, and this is what we have discussed as a function of the bearing, that they give support to rotating shafts. Like this should be a shaft. And there at this X, this X indicate that the, at this location, we are going to mount or fix or support this shaft by one bearing here. And this X indicate that there is another bearing. So these X's indicate the locations of the bearings. Two bearings, one O at this end, one at the other end, they are gonna give support to the shaft to give it free rotation. Refer to the previous videos and understand what is the bearing. The bearing that this is the shaft, we are gonna fix one bearing here, another bearing, and the shaft can freely rotate in the middle. In the meanwhile, the shaft will be used to support a force. This force could be coming from a pulley, from a gear that is fixed over the shaft. And this force it is 40, uh, 44, uh, 45 kilonewtons. So this is the value of that force that acting on the shaft. And this force definitely will be reflected and will have an effect over the bearings. So there are two bearings one at this end and one at the other end. I'm just gonna draw to you these bearings very quick, like roughly drawing how it's gonna look like. Like this is one bearing and this should be the shaft in the middle and there should be another bearing on the other side. This bearing, it has a shape, like it has a bigger diameter here of 150 millimeter, then the diameter is going to decrease somehow. Forget about the details of the shape of the shaft, Assume that you do have something in the middle here. This is the shaft in the middle, nothing else, only the shaft in the middle. And then at both sides, there are some bearings and the shaft it can freely rotate in between them. And this shaft, it is used to support a force of 45 kilonewton. So this will result in some reactions. These are known as reaction. This is according to the Newton third law. For any action, there is a reaction. Like you push a force over an object. In the meanwhile, the object pushes back against your hand. You try to push a box in this direction. The box in the meanwhile push back against your hands with a certain, with the same exact amount of force against your hand. So as you give reaction, you're gonna receive a reaction. So these bearings, these two bearings at this side, these are not wheel, these are bearings that give free rotation to the shaft. And there is one force in the middle, this force acting with the shaft, so, and the bearing, they are used to give support to the shaft. So there should be some reaction that will be produced over these two bearings. These two reactions are forces. So there should be one reaction force that we are gonna name it like R2 or F2, and we'd have another force R1. So just R1, R2 stands for reaction, and you should understand that this reaction it is just a force, like any other for like the 45 kilonewton. But the question is, how much of force as a reaction that is going to be applied or acting over the bearing on the right and the bearing on the left? This depends on what? This depends on the value of the force and the location of the force. Where is this force is? Is it exactly in the middle or is it shifted right or left with respect to the center of the shaft? For example, we can understand that this reaction, these two forces, assume that you have a bar like this one, and you're just holding with two fingers here, two fingers here, one bearing, another bearing. And there is a fourth that is exactly in the middle of the shaft. What should be 
amount of force that is going to be generated in every bearing, it will be exactly the same, half of this force. Like you're applying 10 Newton in the middle, exactly in the middle. So this bearing gonna support five and the other bearing gonna support the other five to give support to the 10 kilonewton over the shaft. So it means that like, this is like a weight. Like you already putting a weight over a par and you holding this weight by both hands. And this weight is ex exactly in the middle. So this hand is gonna support half of this weight. This hand is gonna support the other half. It means that the sum of the forces that will be supported by the two hands should equal to the force in the middle. And both are equal at both sides. But if in case that we do have the force a little bit shifted right, then lift. It means that it is closer to this force. It means that the force, this bearing support more force than the other bearing. Why? Because the force it is closer to it. It comes close to this bearing. So as it is shifted towards any one of the bearing, the force over that bearing will be increasing. But if in case that this force exactly in the middle, they are gonna be even, the both forces or actions will be the same. Distributed equal, equally between the two bearings. But in case that it is shifted right or left, it means that this indicates that one bearing will be carrying more force than the other bearing, or the action at one bearing, it will be bigger than the other bearing. So for this case, for example, this R2 definitely, without solving or doing mathematics or anything, R2, it is bigger than R1. Why? Because this force, it is kind of shifted more to the right. Make sense? So the question is, how much is R1 and R2? These are the reactions. What is the importance of these reaction things? As I said, one in the mechanical design course, this is the first step that you are going to do is just to calculate the reactions acting on the bearing in order if you are required to design a bearing. The design of the bearing, it means that there are like a category, so many bearings, which bearing that is most suitable to be used with this shaft, this requires first that you should calculate the R1 and R2, how much they are. Then you can go to and do some other procedure and calculation. Then you're gonna choose the best bearing that could be used with this shaft to support this force 45 kilonewton. Make sense? Here we will not do any design, but the only thing that we're gonna do, we're just gonna do the first step. How much are these reactions, R1 and R2? So these are two unknowns. It means that to find these two unknowns, this requires two equations. Here we are talking mathematics. Two equations, so how we can drive these two equations? This requires force and moment analysis. We discussed how we can calculate the forces, how we can calculate the moment, and we said that this moment it is the indirect effect of the force. So we can apply two static equilibrium, one for that the sum of forces should be zero and the sum of moments will be zero. So let us apply the first condition, but to make it easy for you, because you could be confused by the lots of details and dimensions that found over this shaft, don't be confused. You can simply convert this complicated drawing into a simple shaft, like one line. Assume that this shaft is just one line here that is supported by one bearing at this end, and there is another bearing at the other end. Very simple. Assume this thing like a bearing and there is another bearing. And this is the shaft in between. You can even replace representing the bearing. You can draw the bearing in this way, like one bearing here. This is another option to be more accurate in terms of the presentation. And there is another bearing here. So this is one bearing and another bearing and this is the shaft. And then there should be one reaction force here, which is R2 as given here, and the other reaction force, it is R1. So how much is R1, R2? These are the requirement. In the meanwhile, there is a force here in the middle. This force was given by 45 kilonewton. Before you solve, you're just gonna convert. So we converted this complicated thing into symbol. Another thing that you should add here, the dimensions, and this is a big deal. You should add two dimensions. One is the distance from the force to the right bearing, and then the distance from the force to the other bearing. So your objective is just to add two dimensions, two distances. Ask yourself, 
What is the distance between the force and this bearing and the force and the other bearing from according to this given diagram? So if I ask you what is the distance between this force and the right bearing, how much it is, it's going to be 150 millimeter. This distance, it is given by 150 millimeter. Agree? So it means that this distance, it is 150 millimeter. Very simple. How about the distance from the force to the other bearing? From the force going to the other bearing all the way, all this entire distance, how much it is? Is it 150 or 300 or the sum? It should be the sum because I'm calculating the entire length, the entire distance, how much it is from this bearing up to this force. Make sense? So it's going to be the 150 plus 300, which is going to be 450 millimeter. Very simple. And that's it. So now you're just going to work over this problem. Forget about this one entirely and focus over this one to calculate R1 and R2. It means that this 1.5D D over 10R, these other details, the diameter D over 5R, forget about these details. I don't care about the features or the detail of the shaft. The shaft to me, it is just one line that is supported by two bearings, one right, one left. I need two distances, the distance from this force to the right bearing, the distance from this force to the left bearing. Very simple. Then go ahead and solve. Solve for what? You're just going to apply two conditions. We need two conditions. Why? Because we do have two unknowns, R1 and R2. So the first condition is that the sum of forces, the sum of the forces, parallel to what? Parallel to X, do have any forces horizontal? No, we don't have any forces horizontal. So there is no need to apply this condition. This is, will not be counted. Anyway, it will be zero equals zero. It means that this is going to give us a null equation. It means that there is no need to apply this condition. But all the forces are vertical in the y direction. So I'm just going to sum the forces that parallel to y equals. How many forces do I have parallel to y? We do have one force. Now we're going to work over this one. Forget about this side. Work over the new representation. So, we do have R1, R2, and the 45 kilonewton. Um, the R1 will be positive. Why? It's going up. Assuming that the any force going up, it is positive. R2, it is positive. So, R1 is positive. Plus R2, it is positive. But the 45 kilonewton will be negative. Why? It goes down. This sum, it should equal to zero. This is according to the Newton static equilibrium, and this is going to give us the first equation. Remember that we do have two unknowns, so we need two equations. This is the first of them, that the sum of forces in the y direction equals zero. How about the second equilibrium condition or the second equation, that the sum of moments, it should equal to zero according to the Newton. Uh, but when we discuss the moment, we said that the moment, it should be calculated at a certain point. It means that it should, the point, it should be specified to you. In this example, and this is what we conventionally do as mechanical design engineer, that we are the one who are deciding which at which point you calcula calculate the moment. Generally speaking, according to the Newton, the sum of the moment at any point that belong to this shaft, it should equal to zero. At any point, whatever it is. But be smart. What does it mean? I'm seeking two unknowns. For example, I can calculate the moment at this point, so you're going to end up with an equation. This equation will include the two unknowns, R1 and R2. But if you calculated the moment, for example, at this point, which is directly over R2, R1, R1 will have no moment at this point. At this, and this is going to give you one equation in one unknown. This is going to make the calculation of the mathematics after that more easy. You got my point? So that's why the mathematics it is linked to what we are doing as mechanical design engineer. So again, the second equation you can choose at any point. You can calculate the moment at any point, whatever it is, that belongs to the shaft. It's up to you. And you're going to end up with the same result. Any point. But be smart. How? It is better to calculate the moment at the point at which one of the two unknowns. Like for example, I'm gonna calculate, let us give names. Let us assume that this point is point A and this point is point B. So the there is at point A and there is point B. It is better to calculate at point A or point B, either one, it's up to you. You're gonna end up with the same result. 
also you can calculate the moment at any point, whatever it is. You're going to end up with the same result. But the best option is either point A or point B. Why A or B? Because these points have the unknowns. R1 acting on point A, R2 acting on B, point B. So if you calculated the moment, for example, at point A, and let us calculate the moment at point A, equals how much it is. We assume to calculate the moment, you should assume one direction is positive, the other direction is negative. So let us assume that the clockwise direction is negative and the counterclockwise direction is positive. Let us assume that. Make sense? So then your objective would have three forces. Let us calculate the moment from the three forces. Let us start with the 45 kilonewton. The 45 kilonewton, if I ask you to calculate the moment of this force, the moment of any force, as we discussed, it should equal to the force, which is 45, times the distance from that force to the point at which you're calculating the moment. We are calculating the moment at point A. So what is the distance from point A to the force? It is 450 millimeters. So it should be times 450 millimeter. This is the moment due to the 45 kilonewton. What is the sign? You should specify the sign. Is it positive or negative according to these two directions? How we can specify the sign? Assume that you're already landing or riding, I'm sorry, riding a rocket. And you're going to travel in the same direction of the force going to the point at which you're already calculating the moment. I'm calculating at A. So if you move to go to A in the same direction of the force, you're going to rotate in this direction. This direction, is it clockwise or counterclockwise direction? This is clockwise direction. According to my assumptions, the clockwise is going to be negative. This means that you're just going to plug negative here. So this is the moment from the 45 Newton. Are we done? Not yet. Why? We have to calculate the moment from every single force. We have three forces, so we need three moments. How about the moment due to R2? So it will be R2, which is the force. We have no clue how much is R2. We are seeking its value, so just R2, times the distance. How much is the distance from R2 to the point that you're calculating at? I'm calculating at point A. So the distance from R2, the normal distance from R2 to point A, it will be this horizontal distance. These are the only two distances. So the distance from this force or from this point to A, how much it is? It will be the 150 plus the 440 and 50. So this is going to give us uh, in total 600 distance. How about the sign? Is it positive or negative? So if I ask you to travel riding a rocket, and you're going to go up. As you can see, the rocket goes up. This is the direction of the force. To go to A, so you're just going to travel in this direction. Then you're going to land at A. So this will be the direction of the moment. This direction of the moment, is it clockwise or counterclockwise? It rotates counterclockwise. According to my assumption, counterclockwise, it should be positive. It means that here, this term will be positive. So this is the first moment, this is the second moment. How about the third moment, which is the moment due to R1? How much is the moment due to R1? So it should be R1, this is the force. We have no clue how much is R1, times the distance. How much is the distance from R1 to point A? It will be zero. Why there is no distance, there is no normal distance between them. As we discussed, any force, that goes over the point, passes through the point that you're calculating the moment at, the moment due to that force will be zero. R1 is going over A. It means that it has zero moment at A, but it has moment at any other point. But at A, it will be zero. It means it will be zero. So this term will be canceled. So this is going to make the equation more simple. It has only one unknown which is R2, R1 had been canceled because it has zero moment at point A. So that's why when you calculate the moment in the second equation, choose one of the points that has the unknowns, either point A or point B. You're going to end up with the same result. You're going to get R1 and R2 with the same values. It doesn't matter which point that you can calculate. The, you can calculate the moment at any point, whatever it is, through the bar. 
and you're going to end up with the same result. But to make the calculation simple, choose one of the points that has the unknowns, R1 and R2, either A or B. Make sense? So then you're just going to plug the condition that this sum, it should equal to zero according to the Newton's second law. This is going to give us the second equation. So now we need to solve these two equations. The first equation has two unknowns, R1 and R2, but the second equation has only one unknown, which is R2. Can we solve this second equation for R2? Yes, then we, once we find R2, you're gonna plug it here. So how we can solve? So now I'm just gonna solve equation two, four, the R2. Remember that we're just seeking how much is R1 and R2. This is the main requirement in this problem, or this example. So R2, how we can find it simply? You're just going to calculate this term and move it to the right. So this term, four, 45 times 450, this is going to give us negative 2250. This multiplication, and we do have negative here, plus 600 R2 which is 600 times R2 or R2 times 600, it is the same equals zero. Now, if you just move this one to the right, it will be moved with the uh, opposite sign, then you're just gonna divide by 600. So this is gonna give us 600 R2 equals 20, 25, zero. Then you're gonna divide both sides by 600 and 600. So this is gonna give us at the end R2, how much it is. So it will be divided by 600. This is going to give us the 33.75. This is R2. Remember that R2, it is a force. So it should have, so it should have the same unit as any other force. The force that was given to us, it is only one force, was given by 45 kilonewton. So the unit, it is kilonewton. It means that it should be kilonewton, the same unit as the given force. So we got R2. We're still seeking R1. We have to find R2 and R1. Once you found R2, your objective is just to plug it into the first equation. We use the second equation to find R2. It means that you cannot use the second equation anymore. Now you have to use the first equation. So you're just going to plug this R2 as you got it into the first equation with the same, this is the tricky bar, with the same sign as you got it what does it mean if you got it positive you're gonna plug it here positive if you got it negative you're gonna plug it negative with the same sign as you got it from the second equation plug it there so simply you're just gonna plug it with the same sign we already got it positive plug it here you're gonna end up with the r1 so solve for r1 solve for r1 from equation one. So from equation one, we already have R1, we have no clue how much it is. We're just seeking its value. R2, we got it by positive, the same sign. If it is negative, negative, 33.75, negative this value, which is 45. Negative 45 equals zero. So simply, this is gonna give us R1. If you sum this term, negative 45, 33.75, Negative 45, this is going to give us negative 11.25 equals 0. Then simply, if you move this term to the right-hand side, you're going to end up with R1 equals 11.25 kilonewton. Why kilonewton? Because all the forces that we are dealing are in kilonewton. So we got R1 and we got the R2 and these are the requirements. These are the reactions at the bearing. So we're going to say that the reactions at the bearing, the reactions at the two bearings are R1 equals 11.25 kilonewton, while R2 equals the thing that we got by 33.75, 33.75 kilonewton. Make sense? Does these values make sense? Yes. Why? One condition is that the sum of the two forces should be 45. If you sum 11.25 plus 33.75, definitely this is going to give us the total force. It means that this total force 45, it is distributed between the two bearings. 
This bearing is going to take some of this force. The other bearing is, is going to take the other, some. And another thing that makes sense is that R2 should be bigger than R1 because the 45 is shifted somehow closer to the R2. It means that R2 support more forces than the R1. And this makes sense. R2 is 33.75, but R1 it is 11.25. So it makes sense. You got it? So this is for this example. Now in this example, it is very simple example, direct substitution. It is required in this one to calculate the shear stress acting on this bolt. This is a bolt that is used for giving a support to one plate and another plate. And as we explained before, this bolt will be subjected to a single shear, a single shear, because if you assume that this bolt is like made of glass as we explained, and you try to move or slice one plate with respect to the other one, this bolt will be sheared and the shearing is going to take place at only one cross section, which is something here in the middle. It means that this is a single shear. So two pl steel plates are connected by 10 millimeter bolt. The bolts are defined according, these are the standard things, by this, by their diameter. Like for example, like this is bolt 10, this is bolt 20, this is 12 and so on. So this number indicates, this number indicates the diameter of that bolt. So the diameter of the bolt was given by 10 millimeter. So 10 millimeter bolt, it means that the diameter of the bolt it is given by 10 millimeter. And any bolt, you should understand that it has a circular. The bolt usually, it comes with like a hexagonal head in this way, kind of. And it has its body, it is circular and has lots of screws, right? over this body. So it means that it is circular. Its cross section will be circle, and this circle will have a diameter D, and this diameter is given here by 10 millimeter. So two steel plates are connected by 10 millimeter bolt. So we are talking now about the bolt, 10 millimeter, as shown if the plate is subjected to 15 kilonewton. There is 15 kilonewton as force acting over these plates. Find the shear stress that will be produced in the bolt. So simply we said that the shear stress tau, it is a force divided by either the single area or <coughs> the force over the two area in case that would have single shear or double shear, right? For this example or this case, we don't have a double shear. We have only single shear. It is one single area as we discussed. So simply, and the force that acting, the shear force, this shear force, this is the bolt, it has a circular cross section. This 15 kilonewton force, it is parallel to the circle of this bolt. So it is parallel, it means that it's going to produce a shear stress. How much of this shear stress? It is F over area. The force it is 15 kilonewton over the area. So simply, we can calculate, simply, we can calculate the tau and the force. So this is the general expression. Here, we don't have a double shear. We have only single shear. <coughs> Make sense? So this is the thing that we have, but we don't have a double shear here. So the tau will be then the force over the area. This is the expression of the shear stress equals. How much is the force? It is 15, and you have to deal with the unit as well. It is 15 kN divided by, divided by. What the thing that you do the, to the number you're gonna do to the unit, very simple. Divided by the area, how much is the area of the bolt? It is circular. <coughs> And we said that for any circular area, the area is pi over four, the diameter is square. So it will be pi over four, the diameter which is given by 10 millimeter, 10 millimeter square. So it means that it should have millimeter square on the denominator because we said pi over two has no unit, the 10 it is millimeter squared. So doing the calculation, this is gonna give us 15 divided by shift pi times four divided by the 100, which is 10 square. This is gonna give us 0 0.19. One, what should be the unit? It will be kilonewton divided by millimeter square. But can we convert this one into megapascal? This kilonewton over millimeter square? Yes. Why, how? The 
this here we're gonna work over the unit. So the kilo newton over millimeter square, it can be counted, it can be split it as kilo, and then we're gonna have newton over millimeter square. Agree? Agree or not? Yes, I agree. Why? Because newton over millimeter millimeter square, this gives us megapascal. This gives us megapascal. So it means that. To convert to megapascal, which is Newton over millimeter square, we have to get rid of the K. To get rid of the K, to get rid of the K, it means that you should, or just to get rid of this K, we should multiply by its value. What is the value of the kilo? It is 10 to the power three. Kilo is equivalent to 10 to the power three. So this is gonna give us 10 to the power three Newton over millimeter square, which gonna give us 10 to the power 3 megapascal. So what does it mean to convert this value into megapascal? Your objective is just to multiply this value by 10 to the power 3. Agree? So this is going to give us 191 times megapascal or the unit it will be megapascal because this value multiplied times 1000, you're going to end up with 191 megapascal. So we converted from kilonewton over millimeter square into megapascal. Make sense? So this is for this example. The last example of today is this one, which is very similar. We do have 600 bound force. So this force acting over this plate and this plate is supported by another platform. So this horizontal thing, this horizontal thing, it is like kind of platform. And this is a plate that is supported, that is used to support 600 bound force. And this plate is fixed to this platform, to this horizontal platform by set of bolts or rivets. Rivets, it is similar to the bolt that used for fixing components together. So we do have here one rivet or one bolt, another third, four, five rivets, as already shown here. So these are five rivets that already represented to use, are used to support this plate to this horizontal platform and to support 600 bound force. So 600 bound force acts on the vertical plate, which is connected by horizontal plate by five bolts or five rivets. It is supported by five bolts as shown here. Each of which is three over 16 inch diameter. So the diameter, this each of which has a diameter, three over 16 inch. This is the diameter value. For every one of these rivets, every one of these bolts had this diameter of three over 16 inches. It is required to find the shear stress that is generated at each one of the bolt. Remember that this 600 bound, which is a huge force, it cannot be supported by only one bolt. It is shared by the all bolts. It means that every bolt is gonna take part, is gonna support, part of the 600. And since they are equally distributed as shown here in the figure, and this is what we normally do in the engineering application, and since all of them are equivalent in terms of the diameter, so every bolt in many of the cases will support the same amount of the force as a part of the 600. It means that the 600 bound force will be distributed over the five. So if I ask you how much of the force that every one single bolt is going to support, it will be the 600 divided by the five, because we are distributing the 600 over the five bolts. So what will be the force that can be supported by one single for, for, uh, bolt? So the force by one bolt, how much it is? So this force by one bolt, the force by one bolt will equal to the total force divided by N uppercase or N lowercase. This N lowercase stands for the number of bolts. This is the number of bolts or rivets. And this is the total force. Very simple, right? So simply we're gonna say that the force that shared by or supported by one single bolt will be the total force it is 600 bound divided by their count how they are their number it is five they already five bolts or rivets so it will be 600 divided by five this is going to give us 
120. 600 divided by 5 gives us 120. What should be the unit? It will be bound. Why bound? Because it is a force and the force is already given in bound. So it means that the 600 will be supported by the 5 four bolts. It means that every bolt is going to take 120 bound of this 600. So the question is, how much of a stress that is going to be generated within this four, uh, this bolt, every single bolt? So the stress assembly is going to be the force that is supported by the one bolt divided by its area. The stress, it should be distributed or calculated at every in individual bolt. So every bolt will be stressed by this amount, which is F1 divided by the area. So F1, it is, we got it by 120 divided by the area, which is by over four, the diameter square. We said that the diameter or the cross-sectional area for the bolt or the rivet, because it is circular, it will be by over four diameter square. And D stands for the diameter of this bolt, which is already given here, the diameter by three over 16 inches. So this means that this will be three over 16 inches equals. How about the units? The units will be the, this force it is bound divided by the inch square, inch square, right? Because it is inch, the diameter was given an inch, so it will be diameter square, inch square, and the force was given in bound. So simply if we do the calculation divided by three over 16, this is the diameter square times the shift pi over four, this over 120, then we're gonna switch, we're gonna end up with 4,345.99, which can be approximated into 4,346. Uh, uh, 4, uh, 4, uh, what should be the unit? It is bound over inch square. The bound over inch square, we said that this is equivalent to the PSI, so we can say that this is 4,346. 4, PSI, this is gonna give us the shear stress that acts over every individual port. First, we have to divide the total force by the number or the count of the bolts that use for supporting that force. Then we can calculate the shear stress. I'm sorry, my bad, there is something that should be corrected here, that since we are calculating a shear stress, we agreed that we are representing the shear stress as tau. So it should be shear stress as tau. This is the shear stress. Why shear stress? Because this 600 or even the 120 that act over the bolt, it is a shear force that produces a shear stress and it has no normal stress acting on that case. Make sense? So that's it for this video. The objective again is just to give you a revision with more examples on these force and stress analysis. I hope things are clear and you should uh, uh, or understand the uh, procedures and the step that we explained over this example. All right. So that's it for today's video and thank you and see you in the next one.